Hello and welcome to your anaesthetics block. My name is Charles Moore, I'm one of the anaesthetics registrars in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and I'll be talking to you today about local anaesthetics. The purpose of this talk is to really discuss local anaesthetics as a group of drugs and outline some of the common agents that you might find, give you an idea of when they might be used, uh, how they might be applied to the body and what some of the side effects or risk profiles might be for the drugs that you will see in common practice. For the purposes of the MBCHB, it's not necessary to have a completely detailed understanding of every agent that you'll find out there, but it is useful to know when you might be able to use local anaesthetics in your practice. It's likely that when you're working on the wards, you'll come across patients who have had an um, operation under spinal anaesthetic, or perhaps who have an epidural still in place for pain relief, and it's really useful to know how to manage these well. Your life can also be made much easier if you know how to turn to local anaesthetics to make procedures more pleasant for you and for the patient, like when you've got somebody with very poor venous access who needs a large vent. So what are local anaesthetics? Well, there are a class of drugs which can be used to block sensation to any nerve in the body, broadly speaking, from small peripheral nerves to a plexus of nerves to numb an entire limb, or indeed they can be applied to the spinal cord itself with a spinal anaesthetic to numb a proportion of the body and provide the conditions that are needed for surgery. So how do local anaesthetics actually work? Well, you'll be familiar with the idea that an action potential is propagated down a nerve by the sequential opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. So each time one of those channels opens, sodium rushes into the cell and it makes the inside of the cell less negative. So you lose that membrane potential on either side, intracellularly to extracellularly. What this does is progressively make more of those channels open as they're voltage gated, allowing influx further down the cell and in this way the signal is transmitted. So you can think of it something like this. You have a nerve axon with a series of sodium channels embedded in the membrane and outside the cell you have quite a large amount of sodium and that's present all the way down the cell. You've got sodium that's blocked from entering because these voltage gated ion channels are shut so there's no way for the sodium to enter. Now, in the presence of depolarization going down this cell, these channels will start to open, so sodium will start to flux in, and every time that happens, that makes the inside of the cell less negative, which means you lose your resting membrane potential that's keeping these voltage-gated ion channels closed, which means sequentially they begin to open, and this signal is transmitted further and further down the cell. Now, in the presence of a local anaesthetic, well, that's able to cross the lipid membrane of the cell because it's very lipid soluble and then it binds to that inside of that receptor and it renders it inactive and so even though you've got a very large concentration of sodium outside of the cell a low concentration inside the gold gated channels aren't able to open and therefore you don't have continued propagation down the nerve and in this way you're not able to transmit noxious signals of pain from peripheral nerves towards the brain and the patient doesn't feel pain Typically, smaller nerves are blocked faster, and then larger, chunkier motor neurons are blocked only with increasing concentrations and doses or volumes of local anaesthetic in the area. There are a few pharmacological properties of the drug that determine how it's going to behave. So the more lipid soluble the drug is, the more able it is to pass through that membrane into the cell and exert its effect, and that means it'll work quicker. It'll also work more quickly if it's a higher concentration in the area because the diffusion into the cell happens down a diffusion gradient. So if you have a high concentration outside of the cell, it's going to pass in an awful lot quicker. The common local anaesthetics are weak bases, which means if you put them in too acidic an environment, they'll become ionised. And if they're ionised, they can't cross over the cell membrane and exert their effect, which is why in the conditions of having an abscess, for example, local anaesthetic might work very slowly or even not at all. Once it's administered and it's reached its site of action, the drug has an effect on the ion channel until it's slowly taken up into the circulation and diffuses back out of the cell again and is ultimately excreted from the body after being metabolised. If you're repeatedly giving local anaesthetic, for example, if you have a, a catheter in a wound or around a nerve, if you're not conscious of the amount that you're giving in terms of concentration and volume and therefore total dose, it is possible to give an excessive dose of local anaesthetic over time. So what applications do we have for local anaesthetic? Well, local anaesthetics are available in a variety of forms, depending on their intended use. Solutions are often used transdermally or subcutaneously for venipuncture, arterial or venous cannulation, and central line insertion, to name but a few small procedures which can be made more comfortable with local anaesthetics. The solution is injected intradermally to raise a small bleb of skin, which is full of anaesthetic, 
and then that site will then be pain-free for puncturing. Larger volumes of local anaesthetic can be used for wound infiltration at the end of surgery, or can be continuously infused through a catheter which is left in the wound. Emollient forms of local anaesthetic are also available. These are topical creams, usually Emla or Amitop, depending on the duration of action and how quickly they need to work. These are placed on the skin and then placed under a dressing and left to work, ready for venous cannulation or for blood taking. This is particularly useful in patients who are needle phobic or in paediatrics. Local anaesthetic drugs are also the agents responsible for spinal and epidural anaesthesia. In a spinal, a very small amount, two or three mils perhaps, of anaesthetic is injected straight into the cerebrospinal fluid after performing a lumbar puncture with a very, very small bore needle to avoid complications. This provides reliable anaesthesia up to a certain dermatomal level, and depending on the amount of volume you've given, that level can vary. If you give a large volume, it will spread further, and then you get a block perhaps from T5 or 6 all the way down. If you were to give a lower dose spinal anaesthetic, then you may have to tilt the patient to encourage the spread of local anaesthetic under gravity, for example, with the use of heavy solutions of levobupivacaine. Most tip and knee replacements are performed under spinal anaesthetic, for example. This is usually with 0.5% bupivacaine, heavy, which means we can tilt the patient to adjust the spread of anaesthetic. The onset is around 10 to 15 minutes, and depending on the dose, you have a couple of hours of good, reliable anaesthesia. Epidural anaesthesia involves passing a catheter to the space outside of the dura, the epidural space, which is a potential space into which you can infuse anaesthetic. You need quite a large volume for it to spread both up and down the spinal column. In contrast to spinal anaesthesia, an epidural involves passing a catheter that's left in for some time, which means you can provide a few days of pain relief. It's a commonly seen technique in the labour ward where women can have an epidural placed early in labour and leave it in until they have delivered their baby. And if they need to go for a caesarean section or have another procedure in theatre, we can amend the amount of anaesthetic that we're putting down the catheter and increase the concentration. And we can convert sensory block with preserved motor function to a much denser anaesthetic by providing a significantly larger dose of anaesthetic. Generally speaking, unless we're going to theatre, we don't want a motor block. So patients who have an epidural in place need to be monitored very frequently so that the sensory level can be documented and we can make sure that the dose is appropriate. Before moving on, let's make sure that we're absolutely clear on the differences between the spinal and the epidural approach. And to do that, we'll take a closer look at this diagram that was on the screen a moment ago. You'll appreciate that we have vertebral bodies separated by discs. And at the back, we have the spinous processes, which are what we can feel going down the patient's back. The other key structure is this in yellow, which is the spinal cord itself. At the base of L2, or somewhere between L1 and L2 in most adults, the spinal cord itself ends. And you can see that below that level, you have nerves in yellow, which form the corda equina. The nerves are bathed in CSF, which is in red. If you look just to the right of the dura, which is the grey structure, you have that blue space, and that's the epidural space, just outside of the dura. So if we were to be performing a spinal or an epidural anaesthetic, generally speaking, we go in between L3 and L4. Two good reasons for this. Obviously, the spinal cord has ended somewhere between L1 and L2, so we're less likely to damage the cord itself. However, it's also quite a useful landmark because of the surface anatomy. If you sit a patient upright, then if you palpate their iliac crest, generally speaking, the line formed between the two will be the L3-4 interspace. So if we were to be performing this anaesthetic, we would approach between L3 and L4 with the patient in the correct position, go through the skin, and then through the subcutaneous fat, through the interspinous ligaments that went in between the spinous processes. And then we would pop out of the ligamentum flavum, which is a chunky ligament, and you can feel a lot of resistance as that goes. The next structure you're in is the blue epidural space. So if we were citing an epidural, we would stop there, thread our catheter, and start giving our anaesthetic. If we were giving a spinal anaesthetic, it would be a smaller needle, because we're going a bit further in, this time we would continue through that grey dura into the space where the red CSF is. Now obviously it's clear in real life, but I needed the contrast, so it's red here. You can see you go through the dura, and at this point you would have free flow of CSF, confirming that you're in the spinal compartment. Now if you're giving your spinal anaesthetic, 
because it's a more confined space, the spread will be more dramatic up and small degrees of spread will encounter more dermatomes more quickly. So you need a very small level and you get a very dense block. The epidural spread, as you can appreciate, will involve spreading amongst nerve roots that are spreading out and also may be impeded by epidural veins and epidural fat and some other structures. So you need much larger volumes with an epidural than you do with a spinal and you tend to get a less dense block. Local anaesthetics can also be injected around specific nerves or bundles of nerves. Regional anaesthesia is a field of its own which is growing in its complexity and its application all the time. It's possible to target individual nerves to provide analgesia over a certain area of skin after surgery. For example, a femoral nerve block, which will help with pain relief after hip replacement. Or you can block a plexus of nerves, for example, the brachial plexus, which depending on the level at which it's blocked as it exits the back of the neck, can provide anesthesia for the arm or all the way up to the shoulder, depending on the surgery required and the approach that's taken. In some rare situations, the drug lidocaine, a common local anaesthetic, is also useful for treating cardiac arrhythmias given intravenously. However, it's very easy to exceed the toxic dose doing this, so it should be done under specialist supervision. So what drugs do we have and which are the ones we commonly turn to? Well, the first ever local anaesthetic drug was cocaine. It's now famous for other reasons, of course, but it remains quite useful to this day, especially in ENT surgery. As well as being a local anaesthetic, it has functions to activate the sympathetic nervous system. So you get a tachycardia and you get vasoconstriction. And these things can be quite useful if you're trying to maintain a bloodless field. So nasal cocaine is still used in ENT surgery very routinely. Two agents that you'll see far more commonly than any others will be lidocaine or lignocaine. That's used both in wards and in theatre, depending on its application. And bupivacaine or levobupivacaine, which is just a solution of bupivacaine in only one of its forms. Both of these are amide anaesthetics and they vary mainly in terms of their onset and how long they last for. Lidocaine is very quick to work within a few minutes. Given by itself without any adrenaline it works for around an hour or thereabouts. You can give up to three milligrams per kilogram. This increases to seven milligrams per kilogram if you give it with an appropriate concentration of adrenaline. The adrenaline works by causing vasoconstriction at the site of the local anaesthetic injection. And this means that the capillaries are less likely to absorb the local anaesthetic into the systemic circulation and the drug will take an awful lot longer to be excreted. It's particularly important to make sure that you're aspirating before injecting if you're giving a solution of lidocaine, including adrenaline, as the tachycardia and hypertension from injecting intravenous adrenaline, even in low concentrations, can be profound. The other more common drug is bupivacaine. This is used for spinal anaesthetics. It's also used for some epidural anesthesia and analgesia in very low concentrations. And it's commonly used for regional anesthesia or post-operative pain relief via infusion in a wound catheter. For example, a surgeon may leave a catheter in a wound for a couple of days post-operatively, and an elastomeric device can solely be infusing levobupivacaine for pain relief. Bupivacaine is a slower acting drug, taking 15 to 20 minutes for peak effect but it lasts for a number of hours. The safe maximum dose is two milligrams per kilogram. Adrenaline doesn't affect this. So what are some of the problems that we can face with local anaesthetics? Well, they're a very routine drug and we use them safely on the wards all the time. And in the vast majority of cases, we're using tiny, tiny volumes to infiltrate the skin before we're performing procedures. But in large doses, you can develop toxicity. As I've mentioned, the maximum dose of lidocaine is three milligrams per kilogram and a bupivacaine is two milligrams per kilogram. If you start to develop signs of local anaesthetic toxicity, it's a spectrum of disorder. The early signs include perioral tingling or sensory disturbance or numbness. At the next step, you start to develop disorientation. You may have a shiver or tremor. And as things progress, that moves towards convulsions and a low GCS. At the profound end of the spectrum, is cardiac arrhythmia, specifically bradycardias, and it can lead to cardiac arrest. The management of local anaesthetic toxicity, like any other critical incident, is an A, B, C, D, E approach. First checking that the airway is patent, and then assessing the breathing to make sure that it's adequate, looking at respiratory rate, depth, and rhythm, and pattern. Assessing the patient's oxygen saturations and applying high flow oxygen if necessary.
In assessing the circulation, it's quite likely that the patient will be bradycardic and hypotensive. You may see signs of shock, and it's quite likely that their GCS will be reduced. The mainstay of treatment is largely supportive, but senior advice and supervision is absolutely essential. If you think that you have evidence of local anaesthetic toxicity in a patient, call for senior support, request anaesthetic input if you have reason to be certain that that's what you're dealing with, and begin supportive measures such as oxygen, obtaining IV access, making sure that you're giving some fluids, and increasing the frequency and intensity of monitoring. The definitive antidote per se for local anaesthetic toxicity is intralipid which provides a large lipid pool for the drug to bind to, which reduces the amount that is free in the plasma to cause its adverse effects. So I hope that this has been a useful oversight. There is an entire science behind local anaesthetics, but it's important to remember that at the stage of MBCHB preparation, you need to understand the safe application of them to routine procedural work like cannulation. It's important to be able to recognise complications, Generic drug reactions such as anaphylaxis are possible with local anaesthetics, but the key is recognising toxicity as we've discussed. There is a useful guideline published by the Association of Anaesthetists which outlines the treatment of local anaesthetic toxicity, including dosages for intralipid. This isn't something that you'll have to do on your own, but it may be interesting to you. If you scan the QR code on the screen, that will take you to the document. I hope this has been a useful overview and enjoy your block in anaesthetics.